Diana, do you want to... Great. Closed door session. Um, this particular uh, session this morning, this particular session this morning is called Under the Dome. And uh, obviously this is about the people who work for you, and that's the United States Congress. Uh, with me uh, this morning, we have uh, two very seasoned professionals. Uh, we have Rob Blazer from the National Renal Administrators Association. And he's in, my apologies. <laughs> Sorry about that. That's me. Yep. Uh, my apologies. Rob is from the Renal Physicians Association, RPA, and he's been their regulatory analyst for uh, 21 years, and he's very forgiving, as you can see. Uh, <laughs> and with Rob, I'll blame it on the meds because uh, he knows it's true. Um, but since 2003, he's been their full-time person uh, on legislation. He's in charge of the full policy portfolio uh, for part RPA, which includes uh, regulations, legislation, and national policy issues. Uh, he's been the lead for them on a number of issues, including the uh, immunosuppressive drug bill. We also have joining us uh, Chris Lovell. Uh, he's a registered nurse for over 30 years. He was with Vanderbilt for 10 to 12 years. Um, he has background in vascular access uh, and donor workups for Vanderbilt. Uh, he's been with DCI uh, for the past 16 years. He handles medical informatics and uh, is the government liaison. He's here in the capacity as a board member of the National Renal Administrators Association. And I appreciate their indulgence after I just butchered that. Um, <laughs> but I wanted to start uh, this morning with just a couple of refresh points here. Um, as we said yesterday, uh, AK AKP is bipartisan in our relationship and nonpartisan in our operations. So we work with both houses of the Congress uh, and we work with the executive branch. The last bullet point on here is probably the most important thing. Every two years or every four years, Congress goes through changes and the president changes. But so that you know, we have a series and a network of pretty senior relationships across uh, the Capitol and within the federal uh, government. So we're relatively insulated as far as an organization goes when there's a change of power. Because our job is to keep the kidney issue at the forefront no matter what's going on in Washington in terms of change of leadership. Um, who we target as an organization, these are the offices and these are the committees up on Capitol Hill that we spend a lot of time in. You have the Appropriations Committee, you have the um, Committee on Homeland Security, uh, you have the Health, Education, and Labor Committee, that's called HELP. Sometimes they are, sometimes they're not. On the House side, you have the Appropriations Committee, Energy and Commerce, and the Committee on Government Oversight and Reform. Um, and other entities up there include the Kidney Caucus and the Congressional Black Caucus. Uh, by way of background, uh, AAKP benefits quite a bit because in an earlier life, our Vice President Richard Knight, who you just heard from, was the official liaison for his congressman when he was working on the Hill to the Congressional uh, Black Liaison, to, to the Congressional Black uh, Caucus. And uh, in that role, he worked with a lot of staffers who are now sitting members of Congress. Uh, so we have a lot of relationships there. You can't get anything done on Capitol Hill unless you have allies to help you get the mission done. These are the questions that we ask as a national organization before we work with other organizations out there to figure out if we want to go up on the hill together. And I can tell you that the two uh, professionals who are here today represent organizations we'd like to work with because they're honest, they're straight shooters, and uh, they're known for being serious people that think long term. The folks that you want to try to avoid as an organization are people that might damage our mission, damage our image, and reputation for being independent. Uh, who may turn away uh, through kind of short-term like attack ads or attack campaigns on Facebook. They might turn away people that might someday be your ally. Um, or they're groups that kind of are on the fringe a little bit and simply want to work with AAKP because we have a lot of patients, but you don't know what they're actually saying when they get in a congressional office. We're extremely particular about who we partner with and what they're going to say, and we ask to see it in advance. Uh, and that protects our interests. Um, for 2016, these are some of the uh, organizations that we were working with uh, up on Capitol Hill. As Richard said, this is Alphabet Soup. This is the National Kidney Foundation, the American Society of Nephrology, uh, NRAA, which I won't uh, screw up again, uh, the Kidney Health Initiative, the Patient Access to Pain Relief Coalition, and the Transplant Roundtable. 
We also co-signed 12 congressional letters. Last year it was slightly more than 24 letters. Um, in 2016, uh, we hit a pretty good number of offices. The year is not done yet, but you can see how we jumped up our efforts from the year 2014 to 2015 and 2016. 2014, we were in 62 congressional offices. Uh, in 2015, we were on 106 congressional offices. And in 2016, 108. We will probably hit 125. It's going to be a busy fall. The majority of these visits are done by Richard Knight and by me on our volunteer time. We're fortunate to say that we're joined by a lot of patients who come into town to help us. They partner with these organizations here on our board. We have a new board member, Dave White. Dave, you want to stand up for a second? Dave is a veteran of the United States Army. <laughs> Veteran of the United States Army, he's gone down the path of dialysis, he's managed that, he's been transplanted in April or May? Uh, last June. 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 So, and what did you do? Immediately after he gets the transplant, he's up on Capitol Hill working it even harder. Um, those are the kind of folks we like to come up on the Hill. You're all invited and you'll see more opportunities for that. So what does it look like when people are in action? So this is a picture of uh, my good ally here, Rob. Uh, and uh, our former president, Sam Peterson from AAKP, uh, who has made many trips to Washington, D.C. and enjoys that opportunity quite a bit representing the patient voice and has done so for years. Um, another person uh, who has done a great job over the years is Bobby uh, Wager, who many of you probably know. She's a former president of AAKP. Both Bobby and Sam are on the Kidney Health Initiative Patient uh, and Family Council. And what that council does is it figures out ways for patients to get engaged in all levels of policy. Um, but both of them have made many, many trips to Washington, D.C., again, to represent you and your best interests, and they're seasoned professionals in Washington. Uh, Richard Knight, there he is on the Hill, hamming it up, as he always does. Um, Richard's got a great background on Capitol Hill. He knows where all the hallways are, all the staff people are, so he is not immune from going from a congressional office and hunting people down in hallways and alcoves that only he knows. Um, this is an amazing photo. This is an event that was done last September. Uh, this is close to 100 patients making, I think, over 120 or 130 congressional visits um, in just a few hours on Capitol Hill. We were happy to be a part of that. Many of the organizations uh, that you'll see listed here in a minute participated in that. But if you know that you have the power of one patient voice, you can imagine what this kind of day did to educate new staff and elected officials on exactly what the nature of the disease is and some of the issues that you'll hear about today. A um, couple more pictures of our team. There's Richard in the hallway. This is a typical type of thing. Uh, this is a hallway, not a lobby, so he's not a lobbyist technically. And uh, he likes to point that out in this photo. Um, this is another picture that was taken uh, many years ago with our, uh, our former executive director is in there. You'll see Dr. Fatum. He's from Texas. He's wearing a cowboy hat back there, a likely suspect. Um, and you'll see Richard Knight down front again because I think he photoshopped himself into all of my photos. Uh, <laughs> but again, the point here is it's got to be more than just a couple of people. Every person in this room is capable to come up to Washington, D.C. and make your viewpoint known and weigh in on different issues. Uh, for collaborations, uh, these are some of the groups that were new to us to collaborate with uh, last year. If you take a look at the bottom two here, you have the Rogerson Institute, who you will hear from tomorrow, and we're very pleased to be partners with them. And of course, DCI, who's been very generous with their resources and time. And their policy agenda is very in line uh, with providing patients more choices, treating people further upstream, and trying to empower the patient. I'm going to scroll through very quickly. This is the alphabet suit that Richard talked about spelled out. These are all the organizations we currently have collaborative relationships with and that we do work in Washington with. So with that, I'm going to turn to Rob, and he's going to tell you some of uh, the efforts of <coughs> RPA. OK, thank you, Paul. Appreciate it. And thank you, Richard and Diana and everybody who's responsible for the invitation. Oh, oh OK, here. Now I'm beyond my level of expertise. <laughs> there we go. Yep, and then do we hit one of these buttons down here? Yeah. The full. You know, this is patient-physician collaboration right here. You know, we're working. <laughs> not that I'm a physician. Physician-organization cl collaboration. Uh, oh, I thought you had it. I thought that was. Okay. Right. Okay. All right. 
There we go. All right. Man. Cool. Working nice. together, we can make a better America, everybody. <laughs> yeah, we make America great on the hill all the time. <laughs> make America great again. No, uh, no. The, 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 I saw, uh, I think this was on a church outside uh, somewhere that uh, it said, um, eliminate shredded cheese, make America great again. Um, anyway, with that, um, thank you, thank you, thank you. I'll be here all week. Um, <laughs> Anyway, uh, I'm, here to talk, <laughs> I'm here to talk about what's going on in Capitol Hill right now. So over the next couple of minutes, I'm going to talk about the state of play, like sort of the environment in Washington that's going on, the active legislative issues that are going on in the kidney disease space, and there's a lot of them. And there's been some stuff that's happened since I, since I prepared this slide deck, so there's going to be some more update beyond what's reflected in the slides, and then just a, a slide on what you can do to stay involved, or be involved, get involved, stay involved. Um, now, I put, as of 9.16, about the huge issues that were still unresolved, and when I did, when, uh, the day after I did this slide, I thought, oh my God, Congress is going to pass their continuing resolution to fund the government through December in the next couple days, and my slide's going to be wrong. Well, this slide is not wrong, because they didn't get there yet. Um, so this is, the, this is the continuing resolution, the CR, that will keep the government open, because the government is scheduled to shut down next Friday night at midnight. So... They have, they have to work that out. Supposedly, it's going to in include Zika funding as well, as well it should. The other two bullets there, defense, defense authorization and the energy bill, um, they're not going to, probably not going to be part of the CR, but that's still another really big thing that they haven't resolved yet and they need to. You know, it's been an interesting year. The Congress has been largely absent um, the, this year, and it's interesting. I think it's really about TV more than anything else. They normally would have had their presidential con uh, conventions in August, but of course, the Olympics were going on in August, so we don't want to interrupt that TV show for the TV show that are the conventions, so they moved the conventions to July. So Congress was really out from something like, I, I can't remember the date, but it was early July until early September. 60-day uh, recess, which is probably as long as I think there's ever been. And you know, it's interesting because uh, right now the Republican leadership on some of the things they want to move on are saying the Democrats are dragging their feet, and Harry Reid has responded, well, you took the longest recess in the history of Congress. Whose fault is that? So anyway... Yeah, but the thing is, when they've been here, a lot of stuff has been happening. It's sort of like the, the kid who um, didn't do his homework and he's trying to do everything the night before the test. Um, the weeks that they are in, a lot of stuff is happening. Not that that's all bad, and I'll talk about that in a little bit, but that's how that's been going on. Um, and of course, the election year adversely affects not only the calendar, but also the congressional attention span. They got other fish to fry right now. They were dying to get out of Washington this week. So the fact that that didn't happen was a defeat, probably more for the Republicans than the Democrats, but not necessarily so. I know on the Senate side, for instance, the Republicans were pretty hot to get out of town because they've got a bunch of vulnerable seats that they're trying to defend. So, but, but that's not necessarily the case really strongly one way or another. Um, with regard to health care specifically, the lack of must-do must legislation such as the doc fix is a blessing and a curse. And when I make a reference to the doc fix, for 13 years there was, um, there was a formula in place to pay physician, uh, to, to reimburse physicians. And about the last eight years of, or so of that, it worked out to be something between a, say, 15 and 30 percent pay cut for physicians in Medicare. Well, they realized that wasn't tenable, so they would go back and fix it every year on December 31st to, to, build, to provide the full funding for the following year. Well, that's a crazy way to go about doing things. And after about 13 years of uh, advocacy, the physician community, with the help of patient groups and everybody else, was able to get the doc fix done. But one of the things that that did, having that must-do legislation out there, it was kind of like the little, uh, the little engine that would pull, a, pull along all the other cars. If anybody else had a health policy bill that they wanted to pursue, they knew the doc fix was going to happen, so they would wait for that. Well, once the doc fix is gone, you know, the good part of that is that the policy logjam is broken. Now they can focus on other things because previously they would say, oh, well, we can't do anything until we figure out the doc fix. Well, the doc fix is gone, so now they've got the freedom to do other stuff. However, the curse is that you used to have that annual vehicle that you always knew something was going to happen in Medicare legislation. You don't necessarily know that anymore. Um, with um, uh, the, the, the big bill out there right now is the 
21st Century Cures bill. This is essentially a lot of money for NIH, a little bit less for FDA. Um, supposedly, uh, the, the latest package they, that they have, they're going to try and include money for Joe Biden's cancer moonshot and to do something about the opioid epidemic. Uh, this bill did pass the House overwhelmingly this summer, but the Senate hasn't acted yet. So to the extent that they can do something after the election, what they call the lame duck session, it's going to be some version of that. So it won't be the, the, the 21st Century Cures bill that exactly passed the House this summer. It'll be a modified version of that probably with some of these other things going on. And then the other thing, there's been a ton of activity in the kidney disease space legislatively and getting ready to talk about that. The first bill is the uh, Chronic Kidney Disease Improvement and Research Act, uh, S-598, H.R. 1130. The provisions include, I'll go through these and then I'm, then I'm going to come back and comment on them. Further, ESRD PPS, that's a prospective payment system refinement, and the prospective payment system is how dialysis facilities get paid for the services they provide. Expanded kidney disease research. ESRD patient access to Medicare Advantage, and there's asterisk there because we're going to talk about that more in a second. And then provisions related to loan forgiveness uh, and promoting transplantation and home dialysis. Uh, bipartisan bill, 10 co-sponsors in the Senate and 71 in the House. Now, we shouldn't have any illusions about what's driving this bill. This is a, a bill sponsored by Kidney Care Partners, who's largely driven by the large dialysis organizations, Davida and Fresenius, and they want to get, the, um, get fixes done to the payment system for them. Now, you could say that that's incredibly self-interested, but in fairness to the, uh, to the, the, the dialysis organizations, the um, CMS has implemented the PPS in a really screwy way, and kind of whenever there was a, a decision to make to, uh, that could affect how much the payment would go, it invariably always goes down, and not, not according to what Congress passed and what the original PPS system was supposed to do. So in fairness to the LDOs, CMS has implemented this in a really sloppy way, and they're seeking regis legislative relief to make it happen. Um, now, the ESRD patient, uh, patient access to Medicare Advantage, I'm going to talk about that in a little bit, but that is something that got, that, uh, got passed this week. You know, when you, when you introduce a bill like this, it, uh, you don't necessarily are, you're not necessarily planning on the bill to be passed. What you're doing is you're kind of making a, um, kind of creating a platform through which some of the provisions can be pulled out and passed either separately or in other bills. Last year, this had a provision in it that would allow um, Medicare ESRD facilities to, provide, to provide, bleh, bleh, provide services to acute kidney injury patients, non-ESRD patients, which previously was against the law, technically. Um, but that provision got pulled out of this bill and got passed last year. It was something that RPA in particular lobbied very hard for. This Medicare Advantage provision, provision is another one that was out there that got uh, passed independently last this week by the House. So again, the, the thought process be, be behind putting out one of these big bills like this is not that you're necessarily thinking it's going to get passed by itself, but that you're creating a platform for there to be provisions that some of these can be pulled out and passed independently. Um, one of the very controversial bills that's out there right now is called the ESRD Patient Act, and what it intends to do is to provide an ESRD integrated care alternative, alternative to the ESCOs, and the ESCOs is that CMS demonstration project, e ESCO stands for ESRD Seamless Care Organization, and it's kind of like doing integrated care in, 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 uh, in Medicare. It's happening through the, the Innovation Center at CMS, and what it does is it facilitates the coordination of total ESRD patient care like ESCOs, but the thought process is that they can do it on a broader scale. Right now, there's only 13 organizations in the country that are participating in the ESCO project, and the people who are behind this bill think that they can make that much broader. You know, they can they can bring the benefits of this to a whole whole lot more people. However, the bill has a lot of shortcomings, and I can tell you, RPA, for instance, it, it, the status quo position we have is that we're not supporting this bill. Uh, we think there should be a governing board that includes uh, nephrologists and patients, and there's not one. The, 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 the proponents of the bill have tried to say, oh, well, we've got you know, nephrologist input on this. Well, we think that's pretty weak beer the way they have it um, described. So, so we're not for this bill right now. However, if they made changes, we would be willing to reconsider. And I can tell you the transplant community is very upset about this bill because they think it provides a disincentive for patients to be moved to transplantation because you know they, they presumably the entity that was running the uh, the the uh, patient act uh, uh, plan would have an incentive to keep patients on dialysis rather than move them to transplant because they're making money as long as the patient's in the chair. The bill does, does have bipartisan and bicameral and leadership support, and it passed the Ways and Means Committee by a voice vote on, 
on um, uh, September 8th, although it's interesting, uh, uh, Jim McDermott, who's one of the chairs of the Congressional Kidney Caucus, went crazy during the little markup of this because he was saying, this is what's wrong with Congress. We heard about this bill last night. You're trying to get us to pass it. Everybody in, everybody in Washington calls this the, the DeVita bill. And you know he kind of went off on the legislation. Um, but that said, it got the votes to pass out a committee. Uh, I believe it's going to be voted on by, by the full House, but I don't think that's, that has been scheduled yet. Although I would say that since the kidney community is kind of divided, I don't think there's going to be any more progress in 2016. It might pass the House, but, um, but you know, in the Senate, you can see the co-sponsors number, numbers down there. Only two co-sponsors in the Senate. So I sort of don't see this moving, and I think there's enough controversy that the people that are uh, advocating for this in the House and Senate are probably not that committed to it because they don't want to make anybody angry, particularly in election year. Um, with regard to the ESRD Choice Act, this is that piece I talked about before about Medicare Advantage. It expands, expands Medicare Advantage to cover individuals with ESRD and removes the prohibition from incident, you know, people who have end-stage renal disease from moving into a Medicare Advantage plan. If you had Medicare Advantage when you, do, when, when you went on dialysis, you can keep your Medicare Advantage. But if you were on dialysis and weren't in a Medicare Advantage plan, you weren't allowed to do it previously. This bill will let you do it. It was approved by a, a Ways and Means vo 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 the, the, the voice vote on July 13th. However, this week it just passed the full House by an astounding margin, 423 to 0. So unanimously passed. Um, Again, it was, in the, it was in the kidney bill previously. The thing that I would say about this bill, the fact that it passed 423 to zero, if there were to be some sort of year-end Medicare package, I think the possibility of this falling into it and getting passed is pretty good because even though the Senate doesn't have a bill yet, um, you know, it's one of those deals where the Senate's going to see, well, the House passed it unanimously by a massive vote. This is probably something that has a lot of support and we'll proceed with it. Um, so, you know, we'll see what happens if it happens and lamed up. But again, there's still no Senate bill, so it's not going to take that path to, that path to getting passed. There's a bill out there for telehealth called the CONNECT, and, and great Washington acronym here, can, creating opportunities now for necessary and effective care technologies. CONNECT. How great is that? Um, anyway, uh, so this is, this is the CONNECT bill. It promotes, um, promotes uh, use of telehealth and telemedicine in dialysis. It designates the dialysis facility as an originating site for telehealth services. Currently, the dialysis facility is not. That, that means that telehealth can't be used for Medicare patients when the patient is sitting in the dialysis facility. The originating site means where the patient is located when it's happening. Uh, we are, the, the, the bottom bullet there, we're advocating for the home to be an originating site because we think that makes a lot more sense because then the patient doesn't have to go anywhere. They don't have to go to their dialysis facility to have the telehealth services provided. But uh, Congress isn't there yet, although I do know that um, the Senate Finance Committee is considering including the home, and we've been lobbying them hard to do that. In fact, interestingly, the people in the fin Finance Committee staff I've been talking to have been saying that uh, you know, they might just do it just in dialysis and not in any other, or just in kidney disease and not in any other disease state because they sort of want to tip their toe in the water to see how, how having the home as an originating site works. So this would be an opportunity for them. It also, in terms of uh, the monthly capitated payment for physicians, it allows two of three visits in a month's time to be provided via telehealth as long as the patient agrees. And then the third visit does have to be face-to-face -face in that quarter. Um, Bipartisan, 14 uh, co-sponsors in the Senate, 32 in the House, and RPA has endorsed this bill. The living organ donation bill, I would say if there's ever a no-brainer bill, this would be it. Um, you can see what it does there. The bill numbers, it prohibits the denial of coverage or an increase in insurance premiums for living organ donate donors designates organ donation surgery as a serious health condition for the purposes of the Family Medical Leave Act. Let's stop there for a second. Organ donation is not a serious medical condition. What are people thinking about? Um, and it requires HHS to update educational materials and that sort of thing. We've endorsed this. It's a, it's a uh, bipartisan, bicameral bill. You know, I say that this is a no-brainer, but I guess I don't work in the insurance industry. They might not think it's quite a no-brainer either. But this would be the type of thing that, you know, I wouldn't be surprised at all if at the end of the year this is another thing that happens. It falls into a, uh, uh, some sort of Medicare omnibus, omnibus bill. Okay, now here's some really happy news. Immun and this is something that's not on the slides because they came out with the bill number overnight. So there is a bill number. This bill got introduced on Thursday. 
Um, this is for immunosuppressive drug coverage, of course. Um, the bill number now is 6139, House Resolution 6139. And uh, what it does is essentially extends the uh, coverage for immunosuppressive drugs provided to kidney transplant patients for the life of the transplant. So um, there were, give yourselves a hand. <laughs> um, but, um, you know, there were a lot of complications with this. You know, you talk to some of the doctors who work in Congress and like, what are you crazy? You know, the cost of the drugs is 10,000 bucks or whatever annually. Dialysis is $80,000. Why would we be, why wouldn't we be covering this? But of course the Congressional Budget Office, who's the one who does a score and a score is a cost estimate of, for a bill. They were saying, yeah, well, if the patient lives a lot longer then we're gonna end up paying more, you know? So it's kind of just ridiculous. But, we, you know, it did get, uh, did get introduced last night this is another one that I wouldn't be shocked if it happened at the end of the year, only for purely political reasons. The, um, the main angel for this has been a guy named Michael Burgess, an OBGYN from Fort Worth, Texas. Um, he's really the leading Republican voice on health policy issues, and he's been totally active on this bill. And he, um, uh, you know, he's the one that just thinks it's ridiculous they don't do this. Well, he's supposed to become the chair. Everyone thinks he's going to become the chair of the Energy and Commerce Health Subcommittee. So he's going to be in a position to make this happen. And supposedly in the last Congress, leadership had, had promised him this was going to happen. And then the promise didn't get fulfilled at the end of the year. So he's got some favors that he's owed. So I wouldn't be surprised if this happened. I don't want to make it sound like it's a done deal because it certainly isn't. But it wouldn't surprise me if this did happen. Um, let's see where, okay, now what can you do? I know this sounds, sounds cliche, but get informed and get involved. Getting informed is not hard. Spend an hour on the internet on a Saturday morning. You can learn all about all these bills, how everything's working. Um, meet with your legislators in, in, and their staff in DC or even better in your state or district offices. If you meet, that, meet with them locally, you're gonna get more of their time. If you do it during a congressional recess when the member of Congress or the Senator is in town, you have much better odds of actually meeting with the principal, which would be great. And you're, good, you're gonna get a ton of time. If you do these Washington visits, and the Washington visits are very important, but sometimes you'll get you know, 15 minutes with a staffer and that's it. Whereas if you're meeting them locally, you, you could get you know, two hours or something like that. So I would urge you to do that. Be a resource to them. You know, Congressional offices don't know anything about kidney disease. You know, people can say good things or bad things about KCP, but one thing KCP has done is raise the profile of ESRD. People on the Hill know about ESRD a lot more than they did before KCP existed. But still, there are some offices that can't spell ESRD. So, you, you know, you really, you really want to be a resource to them and let them know, you know, everything that's going on in your life as a patient and the complications and the challenges you face and the, and, and, and the good things that happen as well. AAKP, I know the social media activities are a big focus of this meeting. Be sure to utilize the AAKP social media apparatus. And actually, I looked up the word apparatus. Um, the plural is apparatus, because I was wondering if I should put in apparatuses, but it's not. It's apparatus. It's like deer or something. Um, anyway, the patient voice is incredibly meaningful and poignant. I, I can tell you, when our PA goes to the Hill and, and there's joint a, uh, patient nephrologist visits, they're just killer. Uh, you know, I, I'll tell you, I go to, I'm not incompetent. I go to the Hill. I make my case. People, people hear what I have to say on the Hill, but I'm the hired gun. You know, they know that I'm getting paid to give this talk. The physicians go and the physicians will be consistent constituents. And, and they, and that is, is a more meaningful thing than the hired gun saying it, but you know, physicians and their lack of self-esteem and you know, the doctor, you know, they're not the ones actually having the disease. When the patients go, it's so meaningful. We've had times when the, with the RPA AAKP visits where it's the patient who got up and said, if you don't make sure my doctor's getting paid enough to stay in business, we're going to have problems. And, you know, that's incredibly important. I remember one time we had a little girl who was a, a, a kidney donor recipient go, she, she was from Georgia. She went to all the Georgia uh, Senate offices and a couple of the House offices. I think if they asked them to pass, you know, universal health care, they would have done it. She had these guys eaten out of their hands. So, you know, it's really, really important for the patient voice to be heard. I'd urge you to do that. I know AAKP staff can help you with this. Let them do that. And I'll give one quick plug. This is my last bullet. Uh, we do do a, um, we do a Joint Hill Day every June, and that's the date for next year. So we'd urge you to do that. Actually, one more thing. 
I would never, ever, ever ask anyone to get on Twitter. Don't do it if you're not doing it. However, if you're already on Twitter, I do tweet out stuff in, in as real time as I can about what's going on in health policy and kidney disease. I just sent a tweet about an hour ago about the immunosuppressive drug bill having a bill, bill number. So if you're interested in this, don't do it otherwise. And I don't tell you what I had for breakfast this morning. It's all about health policy stuff. But if it is, um, follow me on Twitter. Thanks so much. Wow. <laughs> that was a lot of stuff. <laughs> so I'm Chris Lovell. I'm with, uh, I work for DCI, but I'm on the board of NRAA. I'm here because uh, Helen Courier, our president, was supposed to be here, but she fell and broke her wrist. So, oh, there's a broken wrist, so she knows exactly. So I don't have any slides, and I'm... Um, so I'm going to fill in. So basically what I want to do is a different, I don't want to get into the bills because he did such a good job. I just want to talk about a little bit about advocacy and what I see and what I know. Um, so advocacy is a three-legged stool. Grassroots, lobbying, and money, pack. Okay, that's advocacy. So you are the grassroots. Richard, Paul, couple others are the lobbying or the people that are up on the hill and they're trying to get that message. I don't know if you have a PAC or not. Um, and you don't need one, to be honest, because if your grassroots is strong enough, it will overcome any money that's out there. And so that's what's important, is you guys don't have to have a PAC, but you do have to have a voice. And so let me give you an example of the present bill that's, quote, controversial in what your voice or what other patient voices do. So I was talking to someone from Columbia, Missouri, and they were calling, and this is a nurse or a hospital administrator, not, I mean, a dialysis administrator, facility administrator, and calling and has a relationship with their congressman. Passed, so called them directly and said, I'm worried about this bill. This is my, why I'm worried about this bill. And he said, I'm kind of confused. I have 70 patients telling me this is the greatest bill out there. He's like, why should I listen to you? So there's 70 patients in his district that are calling him saying the patient act is the best bill there is out there. And he's going to listen to that. So, and that's what every Congress and Senate office is hearing right now because the um, other patient group and the other provider are doing such a great job. Um, the other thing I wanted to say is I wanted to echo what Rob said is the easiest thing to do is to do to see your house member or your senator in your community. I challenge you to make your, if you're on dialysis and you're in center or not, to make your social worker uncomfortable. <laughs> you tell them, I want to go see my house member, I want to go see my senator, and I need you to help me. Right? And they go, well, we're not going to Washington. We can't go to Washington. I said, no, no, we're just going to go see him here. My congressman is Jim Cooper here in Nashville, Tennessee. He literally, his office is four blocks from my office. He will not see me in Washington. He's like, why are you coming to see me in Washington? I am four blocks from you. I will not see you here. But we see each other on the plane. We see each other in <laughs> as we're flying back and one forth. One of the co-sponsors for the immuno bill, by the way. Co yeah. Cooper's one of the original co-sponsors. So that's why you need to go see the folks in the office. So that, and then what happens is, is they, each week there's a phone call between the local office and the national office. And they go, who's coming to the office? Each week they go, what is the most email we're getting? What's it about? 
And they talk about those things. And, and that's what grassroots does. It brings it up and makes the um, congressman know what's going on in the community. And I will tell you this. There's one thing your congressman hates, hates more than anything else, is to find out after a vote that people were upset about it. They, you go in there and you say, I'm just doing you a favor. I want you to know what's going on in the community. Now, he still may vote for it, but at least he knew. They, they really hate it when you come to me after I voted for it and after I did that, and I had no clue, it really upsets them. So you have a strong voice. There's people in this room that we've been at too many of these um, TEPs and other things where a patient will stand, it'll be a room bigger than this, and it'll all be professionals, and a patient will come up to the microphone and say, I'm a patient. That whole room just shuts up. Shuts up. Same thing with your congressman, same thing. I'm a patient. It's like that, what is that uh, financial thing? When E.F. Hutton speaks every, or, or whatever, everyone listens. It's like that. So you have a voice. So let me tell you, the easiest thing to do on any of these bills or any of these voices are, is there's three things that you need to do. You need to tell your story and you tell it short, in a short time because that your story needs to be told. You need to tell them what your goal in life is. If you haven't figured that out, then you need to spend some time on that. I'm serious. It's hard for me to figure out my goals in life, and I'm not sick. So then you tell them how this issue will affect your goal. If my goal is to watch my son graduate so I can get a boat and fish every day, and he has to drive me to my dialysis unit, and this thing is going to stop that relationship, or I have to go to a different place, so I can't have that quality time for him to drive me, this bill is going to do that, that's very powerful. What is this issue going to do to me about my goals? And you can do it very quickly, and that's more powerful than trying to say, you know, the capitation rate, you know, if you look at the risk factors and the blah, 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 the, you know, who cares? It's about what it's going to do to you. And you guys are the rock stars. You're here. You're, you're the guys that can speak for everyone else that you know can't speak because they're not doing so well. You're the rock stars. You're it. That's it. Okay, we'll go ahead and uh, take a, uh, a couple of questions. I think we have time for three or four. Thank you very much, Chris. I appreciate it. <laughs> um, very candid folks, by the way, and uh, trusted allies. Any questions? Hey, Bob. Uh, I assume you are saying it's important for everyone to contact their representatives and let them know what their thoughts are. Would you have some su suggestion on just So, so what when, I would. When you get through answering that, I'd like to give some experience on that if you got just a second. Sure. So, so Washington is a relationship. So what I would do is I would go to your office and say, I don't have an issue. I just want you to know who I am. There's a bunch of this crazy stuff going out there that I'm following. I don't really know my issue yet. But when you do that, the next time you come in, you don't have to tell them your story. You don't have to tell them your goals. It's like, you know, this bill's here, and you're just talking about the bill. So it's all about a relationship, and that's what Rob and I do. We go around, and we're first we just introduce ourselves, and so that when the hot fire happens, you're going right to the issue. You already have credibility, and you're doing that. And so you can do that in your offices now. I'd absolutely agree with that. If every time you're going to your elected representatives because you need something, 
then that then, you know that sort of speaks volumes. If you have that established relationship and you're just saying, hey, I'm checking in, I'm doing well with my kidney disease, but you know, I I just want to make sure you know who I am and everything. It might be that when they have an issue, they'll call you to say, where are you guys at on the Patient Act? So that's that's where you want to be. You want to be to the point. Say, I'm a resource for you. You need to know what the patients are thinking. Here's my phone number. And when you start getting the phone calls, and you know you're an advocate, then get another one. Now, I'd like I'd like to give you just a little oh. experience on that, and I. I want each one of you to understand uh, how important you are, not only yourself, but your family. Uh, back in 1970, I was 35 years old, and my dad was 57, and he had never been sick before that we knew about. He had worked every day, and I didn't remember my daddy ever laying off from work. And all of a sudden, he got sick with headaches, and we couldn't figure out what was wrong. Carried him to a little country doctor, and the doctor says, after a little test, he says, uh, well, uh, call the family in. He said, your dad's got kidney failure. He won't live three months. The best thing you could do is to carry him home and get his affairs in order and make him as comfortable as you can. Tough situation. Uh, the issue is, I knew, knew David Pryor. David Pryor was a congressman from a little town of Camden, Arkansas, 20 miles away, and I had helped him get elected office. <laughs> Didn't know at the time, David Pryor was a big deal, representative and went on to be a senator. Didn't know at the time, but David only had one kidney. But anyway, to make it, try to make it a little short, <laughs> we got my dad in the med center at Little Rock. At the, at the time in 1970, they had a research grant for five patients. And they told us, uh, yeah, we, we can uh, get your dad in as soon as we have a bid. So that meant somebody had to pass. And we did, after a couple of days, they called, and we got Dad in the, off, in the med center. They'd done all these tests, and they'd say, well, here's the deal. Your dad's got kidney failure, but we can save his life if you've got the money. And if you don't have the money, he can die like all the rest of them have. Hmm, didn't know that. Here, I'm 35 years old. I thought they cured people. I didn't know you died just because you didn't have money. Boy, was that an eye-opener. Anyway, I said, well, how much money are we talking about? They had a hard time coming up with that after two or three days. They said, we'll let you know. <laughs> hmm. We were lucky. Baptist Hospital had just started a dial home dialysis program, but they had no patients. This was in September, and they had started this in July. Nobody qualified. Personally, with my family, I was lucky. I had a little business that I had, was doing pretty good at, and I also was a telegraph operator on the railroad. I worked at night from 4 to 12, as a telegraph operator, and I run my business during the day. Had two little kids, and I thought I was really hitting them until this come along. But what really happened, the doctors them said it would take probably $12,500. Today I waste more money than that on vacations than I do anything else. <laughs> but at that time, $12,500 was a mountain. But I convinced those people that I could take care of that. Gee, gee, was I mistaken. Because there's so many other things that come along that you don't know about. We went home, we learned how to operate that kidney machine, a little travel and all. I showed pictures of it at, when you were in Little Rock. Well, we had it on demo at Little Rock. We still got it. It cost 
That machine cost fifteen hundred dollars. Very simple. It would do the job today. Needed to. A kidney coil at the time they did not they did not wash them. You used them one time, throw it away. It was twenty five dollars and some cents. Some sometimes you would have to use two because something would happen. So that would run that twelve thousand up. Okay. This, this went on for about three or four months, and I could realize I wasn't a CPA, but I could see this wasn't going to work. So I, I got involved with the doctors at the med center, and we went to the legislature. And I must say, I had never been to the state capitol at Little Rock. 35 years old, never been there. I was one of those persons that you probably know thousands of that mind your own business, work hard, and try to take care of your family. But what happened was we were trying to get a, a kidney program in Arkansas. And they asked me to come and go as a layperson. And I was standing there listening to our transplant doctor, and he was making the spill to these legislatures for, for funding. And I'm saying, gee, he's just not getting the point across. And I know you have listened to people, and, and it just doesn't come through. And when he got through, I says, I would like to explain something to you. And I did. I explained to him about my daddy had worked hard. And when I left, we had funding. And since 1971, <laughs> since 1971, Arkansas has had one of the best kidney programs. And we spend, they have funded us $1,250,000 for many years. And I've been a charter member of the Kidney Commission since that was created in 1971. Very proud of it, very proud of it. But here, here, this is, the, this is the kicker. We didn't stop there. As you know, the most powerful person in the, in the House of Representatives is the Ways and Means Chairman. I did not know that at the time. But also, but I found out that the Ways and Means Chairman was from Arkansas. <laughs> <laughs> now, I will say, he was having little problems at the time. <laughs> yeah, I'm not going to say what it was all about, but there was some, some kind of a fox or something. Talk to me later. <laughs> but anyway, anyway, uh, we touched base with him. I'm sure, I'm sure that Representative Mills got a letter from, from Arkansas, South Arkansas, three or four times a week. It would be worded different, but the, but the objective was the same. He wouldn't, give, he wouldn't give me the time of the day. I'm serious. He's just as serious like me. Wilbur, Wilbur Mills wouldn't even give me the time of the day. He was not interested in your program. Way too costly. Way too costly. But what happened, he had an administrative assistant that was a TV personality in Little Rock at one time. And he understood. So consequently, we were able to get things on board. And it was my understanding, even though he signed off on it, he looked the other way, I think, when he was signing. <laughs> so today, what we started out with bragging about the fact that we could take care of all of our people for 75 to 80 million dollars a year. Listen to me now. 70 to 80 million dollars a year, we telling the congressman that's what we need to take care of the people. And Paul put up on the screen yesterday, I thought it was 50 at one time, but you say 80 million, 80 billion? 
$80 billion. So let's just say this. Don't, over, don't overlook the fact. Make sure that you contact your congressmen, your senators, anybody in politics. Have them to touch base with people because it certainly makes a difference. We have time for, uh, thanks Bob. We have time for uh, one more question. And I think, say it over here, go right ahead. Obviously we have a very heated election coming up in November. <laughs> and we got the first debates uh, uh, on Monday evening. Can you just give us some advice as far as which party is most beneficial to the uh, rights, uh, uh, rights of the uh, patients? What my fellow patient meant to say is, uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> hesitant as I am to talk about the third rail of American politics, um, it, it, traditionally Democrats tend to have more open pockets. Um, so they'll tend to fund research more. CMS will get more money usually, whether that's a good thing or not. You could debate, but you know that. So that's one way of looking at it. Um, I can tell you from, and I'm going to put on my physician representative hat, from the physician practice point of view, the fact that they're small businesses, Republicans are better for small businesses. So to the extent that that sort of thing happens, that's something you've got to weigh in too. For this particular election, I, you know, it seems as if President, or, oh my God. Um, uh, the wife of former President Clinton um, has more laid out plans, and um, I think people are not sure what would happen in a Trump administration. I'm not saying that pejoratively. I'm just saying I think that's what the deal is, that you know, he's not, things aren't nearly as fleshed out, so it's a lot more unpredictable. If, if, if Secretary Clinton got elected, it would be much more of the same in terms of what the Obama administration has pursued in the health policy space. Sure. Trump has spoken to this. He said he's cutting back on all medical and social um, what's the word? entitlements. Well, that was what I was thinking. But okay. He's already said that he's cutting back. So, he so said that we should do it ourselves and the state should do it ourselves and the federal government should do it. He has yep. said that so many times. Let me just have uh, Chris finish the answer. So, for this. Oh, so, no, 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 problem at all. So no. I'd like to make two comments. One is, when he was standing and telling his story, the room got silent. And this is a bunch of patients in here. See how powerful that is? That's what I'm talking about. So that, let's go back to the, the election. I think the best thing to do as a patient is not, when you're in any office, is not to take per presidential sides or Democrat or Republican. It's about you in that issue, not about the big election and all that. Because you know what? In two years, it'll change again. If the Democrats are in power, then it'll change the Republicans. So if you go one way or the other, you're going to be fighting yourself. And that's why most of us in the business, we don't pick sides when we're lobbying. We pick the issue of the bill and how it's going to affect me as a patient or my organization. I couldn't underscore that more. And if you notice Paul's slides earlier, didn't your slide earlier have something about AKP's kind of a bipartisan, bicamera, or bipartisan yeah. organization? I can tell you, RPA has a political action committee, and we make a big point about it. It's neither red nor blue. If it's something having to do with kidney disease or organized medicine in our space, and it's a good bill, we support it. So I couldn't underscore what Chris said any more about that. Focus on the issue and not on the party. If I can say one thing, the reason why that slide is up there about being bipartisan in our relationship and nonprofit in our operations is more than about a tax status. I've served under four United States presidents and three governors. I've been the chief of staff of the United States Department of Labor, the chief of staff of the Office of Personnel Management, and a chief of staff of the Department of Homeland Security when things are not pretty in the world. And I can tell you this, one of the biggest levelers in life is what impacts a human life. And when it comes to health care, you can read a newspaper and form your opinion about it and get cynical about the democratic process. But when you're actually engaged, you meet people at a human level, and you understand that what relationships are based on are those things that they go home to in their life and what keeps life going. 
And I really got to tell you that to be effective on this issue, you must engage, you must keep an open mind, you must have good relationships on both sides, and understand that that person, when they go home, they have a family too, and they have a kid too, and you may have just educated them on the fact they need to go to a doctor or what that blood test means. In a year from now or five years from now, that person's going to know it. And that's why fundamentally, as patients, whatever stage of disease we're in, we have a moral responsibility to be engaged in the process because those who came before us were, and those who come after us are going to need the benefits of our work. I'd like to say thanks to both these folks. I messed up their intro. I'm a little bit tired, but I got to tell you this. Um, two fine people in the arena. And Bob, thank you very much. You heard from a guy who was trying to take care of his father in Little Rock, Arkansas, and used the power of the common man who's taking care of somebody else to influence elected leaders. And think of how many lives this gentleman has helped save, just in Arkansas, but nationally. Thank you. I'm going to have my guests step off the stage, and I have one housekeeping item that I uh, will go through.